Dear viewers, today I am with the Lord Alex Carlyle, a distinguished politician of the Great Britain and a renowned lawyer. He served British House of Commons more than two decades. Now he is the member of the House of Lords and he was one of the strong advocate for human rights democracy around the globe. And as you know, currently he is defending Bangladesh, former Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh and main opposition leader, chairperson of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, Begum Khalid Azia. Today we will discuss about the recent incidents, what he faced in New Delhi when he was trying to enter New Delhi for this for a news conference uh, as he is defending Begum Khalid Azia uh, to describe the uh, the case status and what's going on and how they are the Bangladesh government treating Begum uh, Khalid Azia's case is a political motivated case as we all know but because why he is in New Delhi I'll definitely ask this question but the short answer is Bangladesh government did not issue his visa to visit Bangladesh or to defend Begum Khalid Azia. That's why he think he will go to big neighboring country and the, the big democratic country as well, India, to describe the media, the what's going on in Bangladesh and how the, uh, the, he can contribute for the uh, ensuring rule of law particularly on Begum Khaled Azia's case, how he is observing this situation, just he try to describe these things to the Indian journalist and the, because as, as we know, the New Delhi based, the all uh, Bangla, South Asian journalist, or the news outlet based in New Delhi, I uh, most probably he thought, we'll discuss definitely with him what he, why he is going there. Let's talk with the Honorable Lord Alex Carlyle. Hello, Mr. Carlyle. How Hello. are you today? Fine, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can go to directly on 11th July, and you have faced a, a horrible situation in the New Delhi airport. Uh, what happened on that day? I went to Delhi on the 11th of July with a business visa, which I had applied for in the normal way, and filled in every question correctly. Uh, I went there as a lawyer, which is the way I was described on the lawyer, as a, on, on the visa application and on the visa, and indeed the Ministry of External Affairs spokesman on the following day referred to me as a lawyer. I had gone for a press briefing on the Bangladesh case of Begum Khaled Azia. I am part of her defence team. I was doing this in Delhi because there is a large cohort of expert South Asia journalists in Delhi. I would have done it in um, Dhaka, but I have not been given a visa to Dhaka. I've not been refused a visa to Bangladesh, nor have I been granted one. Um, I notified the British High Commission as well of the fact that I was travelling there. I had another meeting which is not related to the case as well. Um, I left London on the morning of the uh, 11th of July by Air India. There's no internet on the aircraft. When the plane landed uh, about 10.15 Delhi time in the evening, I put on my phone to discover many messages saying that my visa had been revoked following pressure by the government of Bangladesh on the government of India. Uh, I was greeted, if that's the right word, by a group of uh, officials in Delhi airport. I told them I had received a message that um, told me that I would not be welcome in India. I was very insulted by this, but nevertheless that was the situation. I had been advised through the British Foreign Office and the British High Commission that this decision would not be changed. During the course of my flight, my very skilled personal assistant in London, realising that I would not be admitted into India, had managed to arrange um, at very short notice a return passage um, on a British Airways uh, Qatar aircraft lead leaving Delhi at 1.50 in the morning, three hours after my landing approximately. Of course, I had an Air India return ticket. I was going to be in Delhi for a number of days. Um, 
The officials were not able to give me any reasons whatsoever for the revocation of my visa. They said they had been given no reasons. I was treated very well, particularly by a young porter in the airport who carried my bags and took me to the lounge where I was able to wait um, for the uh, new flight back to London. And indeed, he was able to ensure that I could see the World Cup semi-final in which I was interested. So I waited in the lounge for a couple of hours and then I boarded the British Airways Air Qatar flight and came back to London. I returned to London. I participated in the press briefing by telephone. Um, that day I was very seriously libelled by the Indian external affairs spokesman. It was a shameful episode. And my judgment is that the government of India supinely succumbed to pressure from the government of Bangladesh, which was an improper interference in a law case. So is there anyone in the New Delhi airport from the uh, British High Commission in New Delhi, because you are a senior political uh, person, you are a member of the House of Lords. So is there any representation in the airport, anyone was there? I, I didn't expect a British representative at the airport. I was able to talk whilst I was in the airport to the British Deputy High Commissioner, Dr. Alexander Evans, who was extremely helpful and has been very helpful throughout. So the British High Commission acted entirely properly, but there was nothing they could do to overcome the entirely irrational decision of the Indian External Affairs Ministry to refuse a British senior lawyer, Queen's Counsel, and indeed Member of Parliament, uh, entry into India. And I'm outraged by what occurred um, I was also extremely tired when I returned home because of what had happened and I incurred an additional expenditure, a very considerable independent expenditure to pay for a business class ticket on um, an airline back to London which I had not expected to buy. Do you think, as we know, the India is a good ally of the Great Britain. This incident will affect the relationship between the UK and India. And what action has been taken from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as you are a senior most politician? You serve in the British House of Commons and you are serving now in House of Lords. You are a renowned barrister. You uh, defended the Princess Diana's partner. So what action has been taken from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office? I don't know what action has been taken by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. You'd have to ask them. As far as I'm concerned, the Commonwealth, Foreign and Commonwealth Office did exactly what I expected of them. I have no criticism of them at all. My criticism is of uh, the Indian External Affairs Ministry, which succumbed, gave in to a request from the Bangladesh government to remove my visa and whilst I was in mid-air, right? If I'd had my visa, if my visa had been removed before I travelled, I'd spend about 18 hours in the air. Um, I believe it was a most unfair way to act. It was completely unprincipled. It has disappointed me in India. A lot of parliamentarians whom I know, who now know about this, um, are very disappointed in the action of India. And I have been insulted and defamed and my reputation in the UK has been affected by the fact that I was deported from what we regard as a civilised, democratic and friendly state. I'm afraid this was the behaviour we do not expect of any democratic state. And let me tell you why. One way of judging a state is how it behaves towards lawyers who defend in difficult cases. Well, in Bangladesh, the government arrests them occasionally. Some of them have disappeared forever. And even those it treats relatively mildly have their offices raised, raided for no reason from time to time. They're very brave people. And I absolutely applaud the excellent and internationally renowned team of Bangladesh lawyers who are defending Begum Khaled Azir. Because Bangladesh treats defense lawyers in difficult cases with contempt. India has now done the same and that is a real disappointment to those of us like myself, 33, 34 years in Parliament, who have a great respect, historically at least, for the Indian government. I've written to the Indian High Commissioner in London. I'm expecting an apology. I'm expecting recompense of the expenses, the extra expenses which I had to 
pay out of my own pocket because I was excluded from India and I would hope that the Indian government will now invite me to return to India to carry out the meeting that I intended to carry out. And the most appalling thing is that the very urbane and apparently charming Indian uh, External Affairs Ministry spokesman in his weekly press conference chose to tell two very serious lies about me. As we know, UK is the one of the largest development partner of Bangladesh. They are contributing in our economy and the uh, UK is a strong supporter of, strong patron of uh, democracy and human rights. And personally, you are working for the uphold the rule of law and democracy around the globe. So why not Bangladesh government is allowing to enter in Bangladesh and why the uh, British government is not uh, entertaining these issues very widely or the very seriously? The British government has made strong representations to Bangladesh about its now appalling human rights um, record. Um, Bangladesh has the worst record in the whole of the Commonwealth for the detention of people who have not been convicted. It has the highest percentage of unconvicted people in custody of any of the 53 countries in the, in the Commonwealth. And I believe that is absolutely shocking. Amnesty International, a most reputable um, NGO, has produced a report condemning Bangladesh for its human rights breaches. And that was a very recent report. The government of Bangladesh just doesn't care. Um, I was criticized by the Bangladesh government for becoming involved in the case at all as a lawyer. What business is it of theirs? My complaint is that the Bangladesh government is bringing political interference into an ordinary, ordinary law case. Um, when the Attorney General of Bangladesh calls in the acting Indian High Commissioner in Dhaka to tell him that I shouldn't be allowed into India, that is absolute proof of my complaint that the Bangladesh government is interfering for political reasons in court cases. Also, as it happens, because I believe I'm a conscientious lawyer, I have read the material in the case in which Begum Khaled Azir was convicted and sentenced to five years imprisonment, the so-called orphanage fraud. It's a big yeah, There is no evidence against her. There is zero evidence against her. Indeed, as is normal in fraud cases, because I've done a great number of fraud cases, I suggested to our team that we called in a forensic accountant, an accountant who looks at accusations of fraud made against people and provides objective expert advice on them, on the case. We brought in a forensic accountant. He's told us that there is nothing to look at. There is no work for him to do because there is no accountancy. There are, no, there are numbers which are produced out of thin air, but there is no evidence of Begum Khaled Azir being involved in any way in any fraudulent activity or acting dishonestly in any way. The whole case, I'm afraid, is just a put-up job for political reasons. The giveaway for that is that in the court documents, Everywhere it says she was the former Prime Minister, but it's got nothing to do with the case. It shows that this is a political construct created by the Bangladesh government. I presume their motive is to keep her out of the election when it happens. Yeah, to, and to eliminate the, from the national politics, you know. To eliminate her from national politics. They've also brought a trumped-up case against her son, Mr. Tariq yeah. Rahman, he was the victim of an Interpol red notice, which Interpol removed because the whole case was being brought on political grounds and on evidence obtained by torture from a man who was later hanged. Um, there is overwhelming evidence that the current Bangladesh government has now departed from all the rule of law norms which we in common law jurisdictions regard as vital. Uh, as you say, this is a politically motivated mm. uh, case and 
you know, the not, not only uh, being opposition leader, former Prime Minister Begum Khalid Zia, and the uh, uh, eldest son and the acting chairperson of the party, and he's very popular in the country. I believe so. So it is, do you think is the, the problem is their popularity rather than the... I, I wish it was as simple as saying the problem is the popularity of the BNP and particularly of Mr. Tariq Hiraman. It's not so simple, unfortunately, because this government has abandoned its moral compass, its legal compass, its ethical compass. It's become a rogue government in rule of law terms. It's pretending that it applies the common law um, norms which we hold dear in our countries and which we share. But actually it's bringing shame on the common law because of its outrageous behavior in these cases. So, uh, as you know, the next election is approaching. Yes. And do the, we have we seen that last 2015, there was a one-sided poll and yes. non-participatory election. And the whole world, the, the, the critic says, oh, the BNP boycotted the election. And I think my observation is, I think you most probably will, you will agree with me, this the last election was not boycotted by the only main opposition BNP is the boycotted by the uh, whole world the UN in the US UK they stopped to sending the observer to the for this election it yeah it was an unfair election by definition I mean I don't want to get involved in the politics of this I'm in this as a lawyer yeah. with a client yeah. but I'm bound to say as an experienced politician and political observer that the notion that the next election will be any more compliant than the last in terms of international electoral acceptability is laughable. Um, if Bangladesh wishes to develop its economy in the way in which I believe it can be developed, my view is that Bangladesh should have a tiger economy by now, comparable with the most successful parts of the Indian economy, then they're going to have to, they're going to, have to accept that they have to behave like countries with the tiger economy in political terms and the British government I believe and certainly the British politicians I know are now very wary of endorsing anything involving Bangladesh because of the abandonment of the rule of law in any case that even has a sniff of politics in it. Uh, do you think the current government is addressing these issues probably the British government as the, uh, the British government is one of the largest development partners. Yeah. Okay, well, the British government operates in a very British way. The British government does not take political stances in any of the countries in which we deal. Uh, those of us who, like me, you know, learned our constitutional law at our professor's knee, as it were, as young students in university, know that the British government recognizes the lawful de facto and um, legal government of a country and does its best to have as good a relationship as possible with such governments. So we do have a relationship with the governments of a large number of countries we really rather dislike. There is also a great affinity with Bangladesh because there's a huge diaspora of Bangladeshis in the United Kingdom. And indeed, I was brought up in part of the northwest of England in which there was a Bangladeshi diaspora already in the 1960s. So this is very deep-rooted, and you know, I want our Bangladeshis in, Bangladeshis in our country, the United Kingdom, to feel under no threat whatsoever, including from the British government. So the British government gets on with its diplomatic relationship with Bangladesh, but it does make clear representations about human rights failures in that country. I know it has done so, and it will continue to do so. I don't think one should therefore confuse the giving of aid for the improvement, for example, of working conditions for factory workers in Bangladesh, a very important issue for British retailers in particular, with approval of the way the government behaves. The UK government disapproves of human rights violations in Bangladesh. Maybe it needs people like me occasionally just to draw attention to the nature and extent 
of those human rights violations. You are defending BNP chairperson and former Prime Minister uh, Begum Khaledazia's case and, uh, and, the, uh, and you are observing the Bangladesh situation very closely. Yeah. Uh, and this sort of case, we, we, as you know, the uh, more than 15 cases filed against mm -hmm. present Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina during the, non during the army back uh, civilian government when they were in power. So th they lifted their cases and they are filing more cases uh, from uh, to the uh, BNP chairperson and the Tarek Rahman and all other leaders. Do you think that the role of law is prevailing in Bangladesh? No, the rule of law is not prevailing in Bangladesh. I think it would be helpful for the future. For the future. And you know, governments are not there for themselves, they're there for their people. I think it would be helpful for the future if for the benefit of the Bangladeshi population, the major political parties in Bangladesh were to put aside their vitriolic hatred of one another, uh, which, yeah, which is their vitriolic... I think it would be good if they were to put aside their vitriolic hatred of one another, which has gone on for too long. Uh, the people of Bangladesh deserve better government than they receive. So thank you very much, Lord Carlyle, for your...